So let's start. Um, so the word is, after this session, we're going to reconvene at 2.45. Yes. 2.45 for okay. Todd May. All right? And the Esposito paper is available in some form. Some form. Right. <laughs> it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Miguel de Bestigui from the University of Warwick, not Warwick, as people say, <laughs> Dion, um, Warwick. And uh, I've known Miguel for an awful long time, and uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome him back here. Um, and uh, he's published a, a number of important books, the first of which is Heidegger and the Political, from 1998, and then a collection of essays on Heidegger, Thinking with Heidegger, in 2003, and then very much his um, um, early magnum opus, Truth and Genesis, Philosophy of Differential Ontology, from 2004, and another collection on Heidegger from 2005, The New Heidegger, and then uh, taking the um, the systematic framework developed in Truth and Genesis and extending that or elaborating that in relationship to aesthetics broadly, led in 2007 to a wonderful book on Proust, Jubissance de Proust, which Routledge in their wisdom translated Proust as philosopher. Oh, no. It says a lot about yes. Proust publishers. Uh, separate topic. Uh, Imminence and Philosophy from 2010 uh, on Deleuze. And uh, also out this year, Aesthetics After Metaphysics, from Mimesis to Metaphor, and a big concentration of Miguel's work over the last years has been a rethinking of aesthetics around the, the concept of metaphor, rather than Mimesis. That's been a central issue. But this, as I understand it, is linked to a separate series of uh, concerns, which is concerned with the question of desire, and the project uh, le sujet de désir, the subject of desire. And um, if we have that on, then we really should close the windows because it's going to close the doors. It's going to be the windows. Yeah. And it's in relation to that topic area that Miguel will speak today. Uh, and the title is Desire Within and Beyond Biopolitics. Please join me in welcoming back to the new school Miguel mm -hmm. de Besti. For or an excuse, or an excuse <laughs> something of the kind. Yeah, one is always the other. <laughs> for not having a paper that is nearly as, as polished and finished as Kiana. Yeah. So it's more a set of questions and remarks coming out of this work on desire, which is the notion around which uh, concern for the possibility of constructing a philosophical anthropology and ethics, as well as a political economy, is, is organized. And arriving to the question of biopolitics from the point of view of the question of desire, uh, the question I would like to ask is, at what point, uh, if any, does the question of desire, in the old sense of eros, um, epithumia, concupiscentia, um, a, a question that is, as you know, as, as old as it is very, since it touches on question of ethics, anthropology and religion, at what point does that question come into contact with that of biopolitics? And of course, if it does, how? Another way of asking the question is, under what conditions does the question of desire, which for so many centuries belong to the realm of, let's say, in the broadest possible sense, spirituality, broadly defined, whether ancient or Christian, belong to something like a practice or an ethics of ascesis, an aesthetic, an aesthetic, sorry. That is to say, a practice of control, domination, and mastery, 
of the desires in question. At what point does that question become a vital problem and a political problem? So, in other words, this question amounts to asking how does desire become a problem for politics, but also how does politics transform itself um, when it comes into contact with that question. Now, of course, this is a question that we can trace back to Plato and to the Republic in particular, <coughs> where, as we all know, Plato is concerned with the place of eros in the polis, in the ideal city, and does put in place something like a, a, <coughs> an, an erotic politics or a, a politics of eros, if you will, that is very precise. But as we know, this text, however rich and interesting it is, uh, does not tell us very much about uh, the history, the real history of this encounter, or even less so about its current configuration. And it's the current configuration that I'm more interested in. In that respect, Foucault, of course, can be seen to provide an answer to the question, which corresponds to Broadly speaking, the double side or the two the twofold aspect of what he calls biopolitics. Of course, there is first of all the production of a new object uh, that is a specifically epistemic uh, or epistemological object, which he calls sexuality, which becomes the object of a new discourse and of a new science, and of course also of a new technology of power exercised on the body, yes, but of course on the mind or the soul. Sexuality then is at the junction of a certain type of knowledge and a certain mode of power. It is at the heart of an entire operation of normalization and normativity. So, in that respect, the sciencia sexualis can be seen as the entry point of bio knowledge within power. But there is another side which I think is present in Foucault, but much less developed. It's the one that I would like to explore today. And it is perhaps all the more interesting that it is less, less developed. And that is the transformation of the meaning of desire itself. And uh, how can I say, the displacement of its register, which, which also uh, implies or, or provokes what I would call the birth of a new regime of desire. A new regime of desire that begins to emerge in the 18th century, but with a radicalization in the 20th century. Now this transformation I think, presupposes a new philosophical, not so much, I would say, a new philosophical anthropology, but a new interpretation of it, a new gaze directed towards it. And as a result, a new relation to desire. So, desire from an object of mastery, control, and domination becomes an object of action, or becomes a vehicle for action, and even a vehicle for virtuous action. So, its register, if you will, or its regime, moves from uh, the ethics and the spirituality of the ancient and Christian world to something like a biology, a, a biological anthropology. Now, before this break, and of course this is a, a sort of a, a, a generalization and a gross sort of schematization, one governed oneself not with one's desires or for one's desires, but very much against them. That is to say, in spite of one's desire. So proper governmentality, whether of oneself or others, presupposed a degree of control of one's desire. In this new uh, configuration, one governs oneself as well as others with one's desires and for them. So there is something like a rehabilitation, if you will, of desire as a natural and vital feature. One that was for the longest time is not excluded, the object of a very strict set of procedures of control and domination. Or if one does not want to speak of a rehabilit rehabilitation, one could speak of a reconfiguration and a reconstruction of desire itself. 
Now, what is remarkable about this sort of conversion or this displacement is that it is uh, accompanied by a deep, profound change in the understanding of power itself, which moves, which shifts from a logic of sovereignty, a sovereignty of the state or the prince, to the individual, to this new entity, this new type of subject called the individual. And one of the claims that I would like to make is that the very notion of individual in the liberal tradition is absolutely bound up with this rehabilitation and reconstruction of desire. And the space in which this rehabilitated, reconfigured, redefined desire is expressed in the freest possible way and the space where its own sovereignty is expressed and imposes itself is this new other kind of object or this new other kind of space which is the market. The market precisely as it designates a counter power to state reason, the ragione di Stato that Chiara was evoking earlier. And counter power then to the power of the prince or the sovereign and therefore a new modality of power. Now of course whoever says at least from a Foucauldian perspective power whether uh, in this instance whether uh, that of the individual in its relation to the state or the puissance publique as Foucault says also says a new knowledge, a new type of knowledge and the knowledge where this uh, shift takes place, where this reversal of the meaning of desire takes place is political economy. And it, this, I think, would be the second point of contact, if you will, between desire and life. The second point of articulation between life on the one hand and power and knowledge on the other. Now, we need to emphasize the uh, extraordinarily, um, well, the, the exceptional character, if you will, and even the violent character of this association of terms, political economy, <coughs> for reasons that Canada was also evoking. Uh, uh, of course, an association that has become so familiar to us since the 19th century. Of course, for a very long time, as we know, politics, if and to the extent that it was concerned with life, and it was, was concerned with life in the sense of the bios politicos, whereas economy was concerned with the administration and the question of zoe. Which does not mean that the two were not related and did not relate, yeah, did not relate to one another. But there was an, an order of priority between the two. And the economy as a result belonged in the sphere of domesticity, in the domestic sphere, rather than in the logic, uh, uh, an exclusively masculine logic, one needs to emphasize, of freedom and of sovereignty. By becoming political, um, the economy introduces in that respect Zoe within Bios or introduces what I would call, of course this is a reference to the French and I don't know whether we, we would have a, a way of translating it in English, but uh, survival in life itself, right? It's survival in the very basic bare sense of the term of life and this survival I will contrast with this other kind of life, the survie, which would be uh, beyond uh, a, a higher kind of life, which precisely would be not bound up with this specific sense of design. But what's remarkable is that by introducing itself in that way into politics, Zoe also becomes immediately Bios, and in a way erases the distinction between Bios and Zoe. Or to say it more concretely, the question of needs, right, which is the question of vital, uh, of vital needs, the question of vitality in that zoological sense becomes a question for the state itself, for politics, and in that respect is integrated into a more a, a broader context, which is a biopolitical. But the question that was the question of the sovereign or the state, that is to say the question of sovereignty, also becomes uh, the question of the individual subject 
who is now envisaged as a subject of desire and a subject of interest. So the hypothesis that I would like to sort of develop or lay out at least is that desire is precisely at the junction <coughs> of this um, double movement. It is sovereignty at the level of life. It is the vital form that this new governmentality, the governmentality um, that characterizes liberalism, <coughs> takes. Why do I say this? Because it is not political economy as such, for example, that of Marx, that transforms desire into the engine or the vehicle of this new sovereignty and of the conception of history as progress. But it is political economy in Adam Smith's sense, in the sense of Bentham, and more explicitly and more uh, closer to us, it is the political economy of the Vienna School and the Chicago School. <coughs> so, to try and formulate this in yet a slightly different way, from something like a threat to the bios politicos, and a tendency that did not find its place in economics, understood as the management of needs, and understood as the affairs of the oikos, desire as now the irreducible trait of human life becomes the very engine or the very energy of political life and therefore the instrument of a new sovereignty. And it also becomes the object of a new political science known as political economy. Once associated with zoological life and thus with an aspect of human life that needed to be controlled dominated or even erased through a variety of techniques or technologies itself, various ascetic practices and, sorry, once associated with zoological life and thus with an aspect of human life that needed to be controlled, dominated or even erased through a variety of techniques or technologies of the self, desire eventually came to be associated with the development uh, and the flourishing of life in a political sense, thus altering the meaning and role of desire as well as those of politics. So, in that respect, it's through its economization tool that desire became a biopolitical phenomenon. Now, if we wanted to relate this question to yet a third possible strand within the biopolitical debate, one could think of Esposito. And a third possible point of entry into this question would be through the immunological paradigm, as, of course, thematized by Robert Esposito. Beyond, we could say that beyond the immunitary mechanism of sovereignty in the Hobbesian sense, the Leviathan, which enables life and its natural tendency to assert itself, to assert its own power, this is known as natural right, to preserve or save itself by giving up something that is integral to itself, yet extending and reinforcing that mechanism, and forcing, I think, the liberal tradition of political thought into a new direction. There is another kind of mechanism, and that is the mechanism of the market and the science of political economy. How does this mechanism operate? By creating a space or an object, the market, the expansion of which is, in principle, without limits, because it is itself, first of all, the limit of governmental reason, of the sovereign or the state, and B, it is the vehicle through which the human canatus, or the infinite desires of human nature can be expressed freely. But this new space is justified only to the extent that is presented and seen as a place of very diction, that is to say, as sustained or underpinned by a hidden rationality, that hidden rationality being the invisible hand. In other words, insofar as the free play of design in the marketplace is shown or believed to be the sole generator of the well-being and happiness of the majority, 
it no longer requires the intervention of an external force. It is a self-regulating system, that is its intrinsic rationality, generating its own spontaneous order. The creation of the market as a place of veridiction, as opposed to jurisdiction, governed by laws akin to the laws of nature, and not by the will of the sovereign power or the prince, is what allows human life to express itself freely, that is to say, to expand according to its natural inclination. So the economization of life is the mechanism that allows it to preserve and assert itself as a whole. It is the space in which human beings, now referred to as individuals, will be able to define and reach the goal of life itself, which is, we are told, pleasure. In the end, desire is recognized as something like a pharmacon, and as the basis for a new immunological strategy, which we could label epithemology. And my thesis regarding this specific question, again, if we want to try and make a connection with this immunological paradigm, is that this specific immunological strategy is one that in the end turns life against itself and could be seen as a specifically modern version or regime of the death cry. So uh, in that respect, I think it is a failure, uh, that specific regime of design. Now, to be perfectly clear, and as we all know, it's not as if desire, in the sense of epithelia, eros, concupiscentia, had become an object of investigation with the birth of the individual in the 18th century, the individual in the very sort of specific liberal sense of the term, the individual as a desiring entity. If we had more time, we could show how, in Greek and Roman antiquity, but also in the Middle Ages and even in the Renaissance, desire was a constant source of concern <coughs> precisely insofar as it led to all sorts of excesses, right? also characterized as sins, and was in fact I indicative of uh, an imperfect, fallen, or at least troublesome human nature. As such, though, it belonged to a regime of discourse that was spiritual or moral, and also political, and referred back to a problematic of hubris, problematic of sin, of transgression and excess in relation to the law. It was the object of a certain concern and a certain practice, a concern with a life of temperance, an ascetic practice of control, domination, and mastery. The ability to hold one's desires in check was the sign of a strong and good nature. To govern, whether oneself or others, and to govern well, one needed to dominate one's own desires. Why? Because of the very structure of desire, or of what I would call its morphology, which I think is the dominant morphology of desire in the Western culture. Its physiology, if you will, which was and still is considered to presuppose two essential features or a twofold horizon, that of lack on the one hand and that of satisfaction or pleasure on the other. Yet because the lack in question is not seen as temporary or merely accidental but as structural and because the satisfaction is only temporary and accidental, the life of desire is necessarily unfulfilled and unhappy. To that extent, it requires a certain technology of the self, a certain shaping and molding of life that we could describe broadly as spiritual. This is how the problem of desire is taken up by a certain discipline of the self, certain practical exercises which aim to produce a certain type of subjectivity. Now, what's interesting is that, I was say, as I was saying earlier on, this re specific regime of desire, let's call it ascetic or spiritual, is transformed radically and actually replaced by a very different one in the 18th and 19th century, 
and a regime that has perhaps been taken to its extreme limits and its natural conclusion in the last 30 years under the neoliberal governmentality that is finally, we could say, being called into question. This shift and this transformation of the regime of desire coincides with the birth of a new discourse, a new discourse of very diction, to use the game Foucault's terminology, and that is the discourse of political economy. In fact, it's a double discourse, or two threads woven into the same discourse. There is, first of all, as I was suggesting earlier on, a philosophical anthropology which aims to define the truth about human nature, or human life. And there is a political economy which draws the consequences of such a truth for how we need to govern ourselves and others. To put it in the simplest way, the new regime of desire is one in which the role of desire is entirely reversed from an object of control and domination. It becomes the necessary mechanism or the spring uh, for the production of the greater good. To the extent that desire is an irreducible di dimension of human nature, says the new discourse, why not follow it rather than suppress it and give way to our nature rather than, yes, repress it? Instead of governing oneself or others by frustrating them, why not govern with them and for them? The philosophical groundwork uh, for this enterprise, for this transformation, is largely carried out by British philosophers of the 18th and 19th century. It's already announced in Locke, and then taken further, I think, by Hume. Let me just uh, read very briefly from Locke's um, essay concerning human understanding, where he defines desire, he says, as an uneasiness of the mind for want of some absent good, and thus as involving the idea of pain, which he says we naturally seek to avoid. Life itself, he goes on to write, is a burden that cannot be borne under the everlasting and unremoved pressure of such an uneasiness. As, desire, as such, desire, Locke emphasizes, is what motivates the will to act and is the main, if not the only, engine of human action. Locke distinguishes desire and the will very clearly. It is through the will that we, it is not through the will that we act, but through desire. Desire determines the will, but not the good. The will determines the good. So long as some sort of want or privation and uneasiness isn't felt, there is, he says, no reason to act. And in that respect, desire is, as he says, the spring of action. And this law applies equally to natural needs, such as the desire to satisfy one's thirst, hunger, or one's sexual appetites, which work towards the preservation of ourselves and the continuation of the species. It also applies to the moral principles, and it also applies to habits, he said, acquired by fashion, example, and education, such as, he says, the itch after honor, power, or riches. Ultimately, desire is the only power that moves us, as it allows us to experience the pain and want that we seek to remove as an obstacle towards the achievement of happiness or pleasure, which is the ultimate goal and the highest good for human beings. <coughs> now, we find the same result, and I'm moving very quickly here because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's stuff that you're all very familiar with. Uh, Hume writes the following in A Treatise of Human Nature, the chief spring or actuating principle of the human mind is pleasure or pain, and it is that that determines our own desire. Reason alone, then, he concludes, is not enough to motivate the will. Reason alone can never be a motive to any action of the will, and any form of action, including the virtuous action, requires passion. So Hume goes as far as to say, and I quote, that reason is and ought only to be the slave of passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. Okay, so all of this to say, and uh, I don't want to 
spend too much time with Locke and Hume, that uh, we witness uh, with those thinkers the, the sort of rehabilitation of something that was what's uh, considered in order to lead to the virtuous, the good life, whether at the ethical or political level, needed to be uh, kept under control, held at bay. Now, let me simply mention, by contrast, the way in which, uh, going back to Plato, in the Gorgias, for example, Plato encourages Callicles to embrace the life of temperance, which dominates its desires and pleasures, and thus arrive at happiness, rather than the uncontrolled life of pure desire. Or consider this other type of strategy, one that is no longer ascetic, but that would then um, complicate someone, somewhat the, the, the broad description that I gave of, of uh, ancient and Christian spirituality or relation to desire as being primarily ascetic, a type of strategy that is no longer simply ascetic, but materialist, and which aims to eliminate, to eliminate the very soil from which those desires grow. It's a solution that also seeks to neutralize our desires. So in that respect, it has the same goal, if you will, as the ascetic strategy, but through different means. It seeks to neutralize our desires by adopting a collective economic and social approach. The Epicurean philosophy would be, in that respect, exemplary. Having distinguished the desires, epithumiae, right, that he calls vain or empty, that is, the desire for riches, power, those very desires that Locke rehabilitates in the passage that we just read, and above all, immortality, which are, he says, unlimited and thus never truly satisfied, and therefore, he says, a source of misery and conflict among men, having distinguished them those desires from the desires that he calls natural, physica, or limited, Epicurus seeks to modify a way of thinking and behaving so as to retain the latter only, the natural and limited desires, and reject the former. And thus allow one to reach this state of well-being or happiness known as ataraxia. Now, it's interesting that in the context of those necessary uh, desires and natural desires, of course, he includes mostly basic needs, one could call zoological needs, but he also, he also mentions two remarkable desires, which are, he says, friendship and philosophy, without which one cannot attain this good life. In that respect, the uh, model of the good desire is indeed the need that can be satisfied, drinking until satiety, eating according to one's hunger, etc. More recently, um, and in a way that marks the transition towards my following point regarding the birth of political economy, the Marxist legacy owes a debt to Epicurus. Like Epicurus, Marx aims to eliminate artificial desires generated by capitalism and to retain only those desires that are necessary and natural. Yet insofar as the former are the result of the capitalist mode of production and the social organization it generates, the return to the second type of desire requires a radical transformation of the modes of production and exchange. It's only in the communist society to come that natural and unnecessary desires, sorry, that natural and necessary desires will be satisfied and the problem of desire, as it was conceived up until then, resolved because it would simply disappear. This, Marx tells us, uh, and of course Trotsky makes that even clearer, will correspond to a viable state of abundance. And the word abundance here is crucial because I will contrast, contrast it with what I think the central word is in today's political economy, which is the word growth. If we look at the German ideology, there's an interesting passage uh, on the pages devoted to Max uh, Stirner and uh, the pages called St. Max, and he writes the, the following. Um, it's, a, it's a passage that was crossed out in the, in, in the definitive uh, uh, edition. Since they attack the material basis, this is what I meant by the, mater the materialist strategy, 
on which hitherto the inevitable <coughs> fixedness of desires and ideas depended, the communists are the only people through whose historical activity the liquidation of the fixed desires and ideas is in fact brought about and ceases to be an impotent moral injunction as it was now as it was up to now with all moralists down to Stirner. So in place of the ascetic strategy, the moral strategy or the spiritual strategy, there is a materialist strategy that aims to neutralize desires through a very different kind of technique. At the end of the passage he writes uh, the following, the communists have no intention of abolishing the fixedness of their desires and needs, an intention which still not immersed in his whole world of fancy ascribes to them and to all other men. They only strive to achieve an organization of production and intercourse which will make possible the normal satisfaction of all needs. A satisfaction which is limited only by the needs themselves. Right? So there is there, I think, a link with the Epicurean materialist tradition which is very far from the strategy that is dominant today. So the materialist strategy then, whether Epicurean or Marxist, is to collapse, if you will, the sphere of artificially generated desires back onto the sphere of needs to negate the very ground from which they grow. It's precisely those strategies of domination or reduction inherited from the ancient world in Christianity, which the liberal thought of the 18th century and the 19th century sought to overturn. And it was quite a phenomenal task to do that. Now, the new science of political economy capitalizes on this philosophical anthropology that I was referring to early on that has its roots. One could go as, back, as far back as, as Hobbes, but with some qualification, but certainly Locke and Hume. It justifies and formalizes the shift of the locus of power from the sovereign to the individual, from desire and interest also, as belonging insofar as it is justified to the sovereign, what I have here in mind, is the ragione di stato, the reason of state of the, uh, the Renaissance, where desire and interest was on the side of, as a justified mode of uh, action, was on the side of the sovereign power, but not on the side of subjects themselves. So, from the sovereign to the individual, feel from desire and interest as belonging to the sovereign, to desire and interest as defined defining this new political subject now referred to as the individual. But for that, it needs to create a new space in which desires will be able to express themselves freely and be satisfied, and that is the market. As Foucault himself makes it clear, the market, like sexual desire, is subjected to an epistemological transformation from a place of jurisdiction which bore the mark of the sovereign and the law of the sovereign, it becomes a place of veridiction, with laws that we now ascribe to human nature itself, and to the market as a result as a quasi-physical field, governed by human desires and interests. And this is how the homo economicus, in the modern sense of the term, was born. Just, and this is a quotation from Helvetius, just as the physical world is ruled by the laws of movement, he writes, no less is the moral universe ruled by the laws of desire and interest. Or, in the words of Adam Smith, and once we have adopted the idea of the invisible hand and the idea of providence, we are able to affirm that even the natural selfishness, and those are passages that are famous, famous and that you all know, natural selfishness the natural selfishness and rapacity of the rich uh, with their, and he says, most frivolous desires, their vain and insatiable desires, actually contribute to the common good. Let me say in passing that even in Adam Smith, who is often singled out as the liberal philosopher par excellence, there is a certain tension between self-love, as he calls it, and insatiable desires on the one hand as the necessary mechanism 
of economic activity and what he calls sympathy as the fundamental mechanism of moral action. I think we have sort of witnessed the sort of slow disappearance of the latter uh, in, in recent years. Right. <laughs> right. The tension that can be seen as the result of a residual Christian spirituality. But that tension, I think, is later on resolved, right, through that sort of further twisting in, in, the, in the Vienna and, and Chicago school. It's really with the birth of utilitarianism that this tension is resolved and that the market is asserted as the, as the place or the space in which the natural tendency of human beings to seek and maximize their own pleasure can be realized. Insofar as pain and pleasure, uh, Bentham says, are the two sovereign masters, and I want to emphasize the word sovereignty here, the two sovereign masters that govern human nature, or he says, govern us in all we do, in all we say, in all we think, the principle of good government can only derive from such a human nature. <coughs> in other words, it can no longer be a question of governing oneself in spite of or even against one's own desires, but only with them or according to them. From a strategy of domination and control or reduction in the Epicurean sense, we have moved to a strategy of enhancement and maximization, a, a, a strategy of management of desire. From an ascetic regime of desire, we have moved to an economic regime of desire or to something like a libidinal economy. The question has become one of knowing how to govern individuals who are naturally governed by their own desire and the pursuit of their own pleasure. The question is no longer to know what it is legitimate or not to desire, but that which can generate the highest degree of satisfaction for any individual. The problem of governmentality in that respect has become an economic problem where the science of economics and the object to which it is directed, <coughs> namely the market, define the solution to that problem. Unlike political economy in the Marxist sense, which, as we saw earlier on, aims to reduce desires and address the problem of needs, political economy in the liberal sense is the science and politics of needs, yes, and, and I would say especially and increasingly, of desire. Where Marx problematized the biopolitics of needs, I would say the zoe politics of their life, of survival, liberalism problematizes the biopolitics of desire and sees the market as the space of their resolution. It claims that there can be a genuine politics of desire irreducible to a morality, a spirituality, a religion, or a philosophy of desire. It rehabilitates and at the same time reconfigures desire as the very spring engine of economic and political action and turns it into a new sovereignty. In that respect, it turns desire into an object of no longer survival but survie of, of more than life and not just survival. So the shift, the sense of life itself shifts as a result of that shift. This shift regarding the locus of sovereignty from the state or the prince to the individual as a desiring subject <coughs> transforms the question of government, that is, of the place and role of the state, the government in the classical sense of the term. The great object, uh, writes Bentham, the great desideratum, he uses the Latin, desideratum, yeah, the great desideratum, is to know what ought and what ought not be done by government. Once it has been established, I would, I would say, posited axiomatically that the market is the space in which desires can express themselves freely. Freedom, freedom itself, this is yet another decisive development, is itself defined as the freedom to pursue such desires and to seek satisfaction within that newly created space. This shift is clearly expressed by the founding fathers of neoliberalism and as the very credo. So let me say a few things about this radicalization of that initial shift in, in the last, well, 50 years, 60 years. The most radical conception of freedom thus understood is perhaps that of the Chicago School of Economics, which understands it in the words of two commentators 
as, and I quote, the capacity for self-realization, I think it's a very accurate definition, the capacity for self-realization attained through individual striving for a set of necessarily unexplained and usually interpersonally ineffable prior wants and desires. Mm. And Precisely insofar as it is now invested with an efficiency and a rationality that is carried out paradoxically by individual interests, individual desires and passions, the market is seen as the principle, the model and the form of good governmentality and of the state itself as a result. It becomes the model of governmentality for the state itself. So government needs to govern according to the natural governmentality of the market. So what does it mean? It means that the state then governs with the market, for the market, or with a view to its maximal efficiency. It is wrong, therefore, I think, as Foucault emphasizes, to believe that in the neoliberal paradigm, the state has no role or is reduced to a role that is increasingly insignificant. I don't think that neoliberals want no state or no government. They want a government that is modeled after the governmentality of the market. Its role is very significant insofar as it puts in place and generates the necessary conditions for the existence and growth of the market. In that respect, it's the exact opposite of the Marxist proceeding. The most, sorry, so the necessary condition for the existence and growth of uh, the market, the most important of which is competition. In that respect, the status of the market itself changes somewhat from its liberal conception. It's no longer seen as a physical system generated by immutable laws. The model of the market then is no longer, if you will, Newtonian mechanics, the model of which is gravity right? and Newton's laws of motion, but as an open, dynamic, self-regulating and especially thermodynamic system. The prime model of which is life in the biological sense both in the sense of an organism that needs to be sustained in the media and or in the environment and the, in the evolutionary sense of a system that evolved through natural selection understood in the marketplace as a competition. So we have witnessed in the last few years a, a, a significant growth of this branch of economics known as bioeconomics. It's perhaps the only one you hadn't mentioned in the, in the bio things um, that have uh, proliferated recently, right? Because the model for thinking the market is increasingly the organism. We shouldn't be surprised then that one of the most yeah, important fields in economic theory is that of bioeconomics. Let me be even more specific. The energy on which the system as a whole runs is itself no longer the physical field or calorific energy of the proletariat, of the one. That form of energy which is still absolutely necessary for the production of goods, has been almost entirely delocalized, so thrown back at the margins of the system itself. But the libidinal energy, I think, is the crucial one of the figure that has, is the figure that has replaced that of the worker, and even that of the capitalist. So the figure, I think, that has now replaced the the proletarian, the worker, and even the figure of capital uh, itself is the figure of the entrepreneur. So, of all the energies, the libidinal energy is by far the cheapest energy and the most renewable, the energy on which all the others rely today. Were it to fail or vacillate, it is the system as a whole that would collapse. That is the reason why post-industrial capitalism would rather be faced, I think, with a real estate or subprime or financial crisis of the subprime type or of any other type, even if it means bringing it close to the abyss rather than a crisis of desire, which would destroy it once and for all. So the one thing I think it cannot face is a crisis of desire, that is to say, a re complete reconfiguration of desire. This figure or this model, this bio model, has now penetrated the entire social body by creating new hierarchies and new grades or stages between those two extreme poles. That is to say, between the pole of labor and the pole of capital. So 
we have seen sort of extraordinary, quasi infinite differentiation, right, of middle management or back office intermediaries and a quasi infinity of titles. I always get very confused with my sort of friends who work in that world. So director, vice president, president. So you have this sort of quasi infinite series of stages. Uh, but by turning each and every one of those steps or intermediaries into, let's say, a clog of the same mechanism, the desire of the unique, infinitely differentiated desire with a capital D, what we could call the capital design, or the desire capital. The biopolarity, sorry, sorry, the bio, I've been saying this word so much, the big polarity, bipolarity of the old schema has now been replaced by the infinitely more nuanced and wide spectrum of a single desire by a series of stages or steps that one climbs patiently, slowly, by what we could call the ladder of the unifying desire, the desire of money, or better said, perhaps, of income. There is no longer than labor on the one hand and enjoyment on the other, but a single process which reveals another mode of subjectivation, a different distribution of energy known today as human capital. This is how Deleuze and Guattari, I think, summarize it quite nicely in Anti-Oedipus. They write the following. The wage earner's desire, the capitalist's desire, everything moves to the rhythm of one and the same desire founded on the differential relation of flows having no assignable exterior limit and where capitalism reproduces its imminent limits on an ever-widening and more comprehensive scale. End of quotation. In that respect, capitalism is the greatest, we could say to use their own terminology, appareil de capture, a desire that was ever invented, the greatest force to have aligned the multiplicity of desires on what we could call a meta-desire. It's an apparatus that, following another commentator, we could characterize as epithumosynthetic, in that it manages to gather, federate, and organize the majority uh, of desires. But insofar as it also generates or produces its own desire, it is also epithemogenetic. At once, federator and generator of desires, post-industrial capitalism has become what we could call the world organization of desire, the WOD. <laughs> now, the problem with such a desire is that it doesn't work, or works only to the extent that it keeps it alive without ever satisfying it. But since the morphology or physiology of desire on which liberal and neoliberalism capitalism draws is the classical one between want and lack. So the, 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 the image, if you will, of desire is the old one. It, is, it conforms to the old morphology of desire. Since the morphology of desire uh, is the classical one between want or lack and satisfaction, it is also its own negation. Aristotle, in a way following in the footsteps of Socrates' response to Callicles in the Gorgias on the question of good governmentality, had already warned us against such desire and all the desires that follow from it. If economic exchange, he says, and the exchange of money in particular, consists in theory right, of a just and equitable operation between equal citizens, it is, he says, in fact, the constant object of an unlimited desire. And the word that he uses is epithemia. An, an unlimited desire that threatens the very life of the polis, the social link, philia. So there is this great contrast here between epithemia, especially epithemia for riches and money, and philia. Philia that brings equal free citizens together in the first place. In the politics, Aristotle warns his reader against this particular technique that he calls crematistics, uh, and which consists in the accumulation of goods and riches for purely personal aims. He distinguishes it very clearly from economics as the strict sense, in the strict sense of the term, that is, from the specific techne oriented towards the natural needs of life. Uh, one would say, zo and it's a word that he uses, life as zoe, and the home, oikos, or the estate. And uh, maybe in the discussion we can quote this passage from the politics, but I think I need to try and conclude as quickly as I can. Now, 
I think this is precisely the logic, this, the logic of this impossible satisfaction, right, that Aristotle had already identified, that Marx himself had identified as the heart of capitalism. In a passage from the Grundlinien, Marx analyzes the tendency of capital to create a world market in which every limitation is seen as an obstacle to be overcome. So possibly this passage that <coughs> Deleuze and Guattari had in mind in the quotation that I've just read out. This means, first of all, that each moment uh, of the process of production needs to be subordinated to exchange and to erase the production of use value. Secondly, he says, the production of relative surplus value requires the constant renewal and expansion of consumption. So the dynamic or trend is the following. First of all, the expansion of existing consumption, then second stage, the creation of new desires. He doesn't use the word desires, he uses the word needs, but I think it's precisely desires that he has in mind. In the sense that already existing desires extend to a never growing sphere. Finally, it says production of new desires, invention, and creation of new use values. Needless to say, this system, the system as he describes it, amounts to the systematic production and organization of lack, and is oriented towards a necessarily always increasing consumption known today as growth. This is how the following recent definition of economics can be given without any sense of its problematic, even tautological nature. Economics, we're told, and this is uh, uh, from uh, a sort of online uh, definition in an economics journal, is the science aimed at the study, and I've quote, of uh, how people choose to use limited or scarce resources in attempting to satisfy their unlimited wants. Right? How people choose to use limited or scarce resources in attempting to satisfy their unlimited wants. As the Skidelsky father and son, one is an economist, the other is a Keynes specialist, and the other is a philosopher. As they point out in, in, a, in a book that they just published, this definition is entirely tautological. For if you posit that desires are de facto unlimited, it follows necessarily that resources, however <coughs> abundant, and whatever they may be, are limited. Limits, resources can only ever be limited. It is this economic model based on growth that prevails today. But to arrive at the point when it is taken absolutely for granted and goes unchallenged, it was necessary to train individuals and teach them to identify or live their desires as producers and consumers of goods and services from a market economy which sought to produce a situation of abundance from which new social relations and a life in a way of otium would emerge, we moved from, from a market society, we moved to a market society and a life of neg otium, negation of otium, the ultimate but unrealizable aim of which is growth itself. The latter which is necessarily without end, requires the conquest and creation of new markets as well as an increasingly invasive consumption to the point that the space generating life and the question of life itself from consumption becomes increasingly difficult to define. It's not only in reality that growth is, it's not, sorry, it's not in reality that growth is unlimited. The recent economic crisis and the crisis that started in 2008 in particular are there to remind us that growth is actually limited. Such crises are bound to become more regular and could, and could in fact signal in what would amount to a paradoxical reversal the collapse of the system as a whole. Precisely to the extent that it relies on the infinity of a form of desire that sees a way forward only through its perpetuation and precipitation, or what we could call a catastrophe in the consumer <coughs> and speculative frenzy. It's a system that is quite literally catastrophic. So if growth is unlimited, it's not in practice or in reality, we know all too well that it is, but in theory, in principle, axiomatically, if you will, it is and needs to be without horizon or end. It is, to use the Hegelian expression, a bad infinite 
which constantly needs to invent new mechanisms in order to perpetuate itself. Mechanisms that can be soft or persuasive and aim to capture, channel, or funnel desires. They're called marketing, communication, and advertising. Such a technique was quite candidly formulated by a close associate, an associate of Edward Bernays, often referred to as the founding father of marketing and public relation. And he writes, it's a more sort of sort of paraphrase. America, he said, needs to shift from a culture, so I think we're in the early 60s or late 50s. For example. Yes, 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 yes. America, he said, needs to shift from a culture of need to a culture of desire. People need to be trained to desire, to want new things, before the old ones have even been consumed. As for advertising, it is, according to the former director of the General Motors Research Lab, and I quote, the organized creation of dissatisfaction. But as we know, once those soft methods have worked, uh, the more aggressive, at times coercive, mechanisms can be used to secure markets, get hold of natural resources, or cheap labor. Okay, I had a conclusion, but maybe I should skip it. That's you. You wrote it. Yeah. Okay. All right. As the current, so this is my conclusion. Thank you, Simon. As the current economic crisis tolls the bell of the growth and consumerist model, the vast majority of politicians and elected representatives are unable to recognize it as such. On the contrary. All the solutions and measures that are adopted or envisaged confirm the same trend, which inevitably translates into an increase and exponential acceleration of speculation that is, in the end, of a short-term vision that has become the toxic, possibly mortal agent generated by the capitalist body itself. It's as if it, too, were prone to the form of auto-immunization, or so it believes, that is actually an auto-infection. What the economic regime of desire, especially in its liberal and hyper-consumerist phase, cannot contemplate is the possibility of a libidinal disinvestment. By that, I mean a dimension of desire that would be both non-productive, I would say improductive, and vital at the same time. Insofar as it has entirely embraced the cause of productivity and the principle of maximum yield, this engine, which dominates life today, is no longer able to envisage a form of life that would be free of all calculation, economic rationality, utility, investment, and return. A desire, in short, that would be the desire of free expenditure, of something like what Bataille calls a glorious operation, and a joy not born of the libidinal economy. This is the project that Bataille's political economy stands for. Um, but even though this is part of my conclusion, I think it, 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 it's something that we can perhaps talk about in the, in the discussion. So I, I do see resources around the notion of uh, unproductivity uh, of, and around the notion of leisure or otium as it is thematized on the one hand by Bataille, but also there are aspects of this question that I think is interesting, developed in an interesting way in, uh, by Stiegler and some of his work, can be uh, presented as a way to uh, begin to, to, to reformulate, to reconstruct this morphology of desire, and to retain a strong connection between life and desire, uh, but with a sense of life that, of course, is not bound up with the space that we are told is the space in which desire is best expressed, which is the space of the market. Sorry. Mm, that was great. Uh, let's start with student questions first. So, we have to keep your hands up. Some students. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really interested in this idea of um, a crisis of desire as the one type of crisis that neoliberalism couldn't face. Um, and I'm, I'm curious as to what, what that would entail for uh, something like the form of this uh, conference itself or the, the um, academic enterprise uh, itself. Sort of like 
how do how how does the academic enterprise that we're all uh, uh, participating in right now how does that participate in the in the dominant regime of desire and how does that have, have to be challenged if a crisis of desire is about that? Good question. How does what needs to be challenged, sorry, at the form of academic life itself? How, the, the, this kind of academic pursuit as, for example, I as embodying uh, the kind of entrepreneurial yes. impulse yeah. that's the, 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 yes. the neoliberal yeah. 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 Exactly. So, of course, uh, I don't know how this... It, it's interesting because I think that many universities, so, um, of course, I need to stand corrected by Americans here, but it, it seems to me that many universities in America operate according to the model that is more liberal than neoliberal. What we have witnessed in the UK is an extraordinary neoliberalization of the university. Since you have you started into it, left you, right. you left at the right, at the right time. <laughs> but this, so, so this, this sort of corporate model is one that has been introduced. And we now emphasize, and we're supposed to do that, of course, now there is sort of uh, a kind of um, certainly not glorious or particularly grave resistance on the part of some of us that refuse to do those things, right? So there's this kind of passive resistance, but with a sense of the almost the inevitable, sure, that no, we're not going to do those things. But we are supposed to tell students the sort of skills that they're being taught by doing philosophy. And even we would be encouraged to telling them class by class or after by hour, what sort of thing they could bring back in order to grow their human capital, their intellectual capital, uh, and therefore the sort of skills that they can then negotiate trade in the marketplace. And we have transferable skills, transferable skills is the name of the, is, is definitely the trend. And you have, in addition to teaching a number of seminars, and the last one that I found about um, last week, actually, and it's one that I think Heidegger in his sort of existential ana analytic had not seen coming, is being entrepreneurial. The fact that we, I am ashamed of, I have to say, operating, teaching within an institution that encourages students to go to a seminar called Being Entrepreneurial. It's, yes, but but I think that the Gestellung is too broad a category, and I think this is where you know, Foucault is more interesting in his sort of very extraordinary early uh, um, but astute um, genealogy of, of neoliberalism is the way in which a certain kind of discourse has indeed completely permeated. So the the, the vocabulary of capital. Um, so uh, in my university also there are sort of flags floating everywhere and. Uh, on which you, it is written Warwick, human capital. Uh, and it's, no, intellectual capital. So it's not, it, it doesn't claim to be the intellectual capital of the world. It's, it's, as you know, this is what we invest in, sort of human capital, intellectual capital. And recently, also, this other form of capital, which I, I didn't know existed, but has started to proliferate in the English press, which is erotic capital. It's only women who have erotic capital. Men, <laughs> men never have. But this is also some kind of capital so, but it's straight out of, so if you read, you read the Chicago School, you read, uh, yeah, you read Friedman and, and you read Beckman and then you see all of those, uh, all, all of those categories that are developed and now have been completely internalized. So to answer your question, this is the general trend. And then the question is, in the way that Epicurus mentions a strong connection between philosophy and desire, is there not another kind of desire that can be activated, and I think it, it always can, so I absolutely don't believe in the sort of inevitability of anything, uh, so, but but it requires precisely technologies of a, a reconfiguration of the morphology of desire, the possibility of articulating different regimes of desire, and certain technologies of, of the self, which I think is precisely what Foucault was doing in his very late work, although I don't think it's the direction I would want to take, but it's precisely in the Any other student questions? Yeah, sorry, just one question, not to uh, no, she, you know, she bring, uh, no, not, no, just a comment on the procedure, because there's lunch, so I don't want to reduce desire to needs, no, but I don't know how long the lunch is going to stay there, so uh, I think in five minutes we have to close.
Well, no? It'll it's stay there until, 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 until we eat it. <laughs> Why don't we go get it? Do you bring it in? Do you want me to I don't know. I have no way. But I'm going to go back to the Okay, you can continue. Go on, Professor Stoner is taking control of the lunch. The situation was quite so. I just had a quick thought. I really enjoyed your talk, and I, I kept thinking of the pie, and then you, mm -hmm. you didn't ex make that explicit until the end. So I just wanted to hear more about how the ties work, um, next to what you're talking about, or what your you know, mm -hmm. differences, or something more. Yeah, well, of course, as you know, in the, in the 1940s, but I had some sort of um, ambitious and crazy and impossible project, which is that of a, a political economy. But what's interesting is that it's a political, it is a political economy that is under the sign of what he calls the limit of, of utility. So he really tries to identify the point at which the utilitarian paradigm, of course, the neoliberal paradigm has not yet been introduced. So his target is the uh, liberal, specifically utilitarian paradigm. The point at which it, it, it collapses, and the possibility of um, uh, articulating a, a connection between uh, life, politics, and desire outside of this um, impoverished conception of desire. I say impoverished because uh, born of a lack that is impossible to satisfy and locates desire on the side of a certain excess as opposed to a certain degree. And in that, in that respect, I think there is perhaps a strange connection, but a connection between uh, Bataille and Spinoza. That is to say, the conception of desire that begins by asking, in the name of what do we think that what characterizes who we are is primarily a, a negative aspect born of a systematic life that can only hope to satisfy itself through the accumulation of possession of things, so an object-directed desire, as opposed to a, I wouldn't even say subject-directed desire, but to a life-directed desire that presupposes that one is what we can of life. So what he calls l'improductif, uh, the limit of utility, point to the possibility of, uh, and of course, the, the notion of sacred sacrifice, the, the question of philosophy, of art, of literature, are all bound up with that. So the question is, is are all those practices also indicative of a certain kind of design, and if so, what kind? And I see extension of that even in, uh, to, to, to remain within the sort of field of uh, French philosophy thought, in, in, in Rochot, right. uh, with the notion, of course, of diesel or not. But the interesting thing is that in uh, this, the, in, uh, in the space, exactly in the space of literature, he uh, begins with a short paragraph on the desire of the work of art, and it is the object of the text of Orpheus, the uh, regard of the where he tries to pursue this, this desire of, the, of, the, of, the, of art and the work of art itself, which is distinct from the desire of the artist. So those are all sort of indications of the possibility, and in no way does he connect that with any experience of insufficiency, lack, deficiency. Two, two more student questions, then we can open up in general. Um, so, I mean, it seems like in many ways you follow the trajectory of Foucault on this shift between uh, Epicurean desire, a regime of desire, antiquity, modernity, where it's kind of economized, and so on, from the jurisdiction of uh, Baradich. Um, uh, sorry. Um, no, I was just saying, uh, it seems like you follow the trajectory of Foucault um, in some sense, uh, from the jurisdiction to Baradiction, this kind of, you know, uh, secession from. Antiquity, the regime of desire and antiquity to modernity and political economy. Um, but you have a hesitance towards following Foucault's pursuit, you know, taking up the technologies of the self um, and these practices. So I guess my question is, is uh, what is your hesitance towards the direction that Foucault finally went in after he kind of 
you know, launches a pretty kind of, you know, thorough critique of political economy. Um, uh, and uh, where, where do you want to come? What's your kind of question? Yeah. Now, um, I, I do follow Foucault you know, up, up to the point, but even in the, in, in the idea of regimes of design, I don't, I don't know that he's ever mentioned that he ever uh, uses that, that terminology anywhere. Because he's not that interested in, as you all know, in design, and he always claims to be interested in casual. I think there's a sort of false um, a distinction that, that doesn't really, that doesn't really hold, but he's interested in pleasure because he wants nothing to do with sort of analysis and you know, let go of <coughs> So he, he does not make that, that connection with earlier regimes of design. But apart from that, yes, I do follow that shift that he maps out. The reason why I, I would rather not follow the line that he opens up in the early 80s is because I think we still absolutely need a political economy. That is to say, it doesn't address the problem of production. And I think we are today in a critical situation regarding the organization of the production. And, and he does not speak to that. So the reason why I was to spend uh, more interested in the work that I has to say is because his project, however however mad it is, um, at least tries to articulate uh, the problem at the level at which it is to Now, I also believe as I was saying in response to the first question, I also believe in the possibility of something like the technology that we have in the possibility of, of resisting a certain form of power by working on oneself. Um, but the way in which he does that uh, in, in the 1980s is by going through an extraordinary amount of literature and, and not, it seems, by indicating any way in which that could be done. And he's very clear to say, in no way can we use that Greek paradigm as a model for today. So in no way, in no way does the return to the Greek signify something like a return to the model that would be appropriate. So who knows where it was all going? But um, I, I don't. It's, it's not where I want to. Yeah, where I want to start. Um, so, a little bit on the subject of what you said in that response, which was uh, the vocabulary and something like you know, regimes of desire, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, one or well, two figures use vocabulary that's usually adopted quite well is Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. right. um, so, I guess my. my Check your voice. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, my question um, to a certain degree addresses this problem of the reallocation of production, the way to resist the kind of bad infinite desire that's produced through the political economy of today, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm wondering what you view, or how you view the, this problem in relation to what um, the Lizzie Guattari kind of developed as at least something like an answer to this, you know, this is the problem they developed, right? Um, and it's something that they develop as somewhat of an answer to it, which is the, the, the positive process of schizoanalysis, um, the lines of flight, uh, you know, um, detailed territorialization, re-territorialization, et cetera, et cetera, in relation to what you're developing in the project. Because it seems like while you're taking up your, your problem, um, to a certain degree, you seem to be resisting what they posit as a possible solution. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious what the relationship to that solution is. Right. Well, I, I, I don't know that I'm res I don't know that I'm resisting it. I'm certainly not sort of uh, embracing it as the as the solution. I think there are a number, and even of course they themselves draw on a number of different voices in order to signal what they call those lines of flight, those lines of decentralization. And and one of the voices that I think is especially important for um, for Deleuze is precisely Blanchot. So. Blanchot in connection with that sort of is that sort of strange sort of bringing together of that and Blanchot, but that move towards the, the impersonal. Right? And, and, and the impersonal is um, a reconfiguration of, of course it's a word that, that he doesn't want to use, but it's a reconfiguration of subjectivity. So it, it is, it is a, a dissolution of anything like individuality. 
uh, and and therefore it is the openness to a form of desire that uh, allows one to provide entries into what they call the domain of immanence, the body of the body, which they strangely um, interpret as perfectly compatible with what Freud has to say about the death life. So, uh, but of course the notion of people, that death life is a form of design. So it's a form of death that is another form of life, no longer my life, my life of, as human capital, as it were, uh, no longer this, this life that I need to invest in and be part of a form of calculation that always requires a return on investment, but a life. So it's a dissolution of the form of subjectivity and an openness into another. That form of move from a highly individuated, in similar all sense of the term, a neoliberal form of highly individuated subjectivity to the disindividuation and the reindividuation, another form of individuation through the uh, the new sense, through the, the, the personal, uh, through the anorganic body, through a sense of life that is no longer mine but a life. Yes, that, that I subscribe to. It's up to um, eager faculty questions. And Dick was first. Uh, um, no, I, I, I enjoyed my work. Yeah, in some ways, you're often, let me put it on the material, like what is happening, so powerful in terms of the kind of domain that project. Yeah, I'm saying that the argument is so powerful about on a material level of the transformation of the type of design, I find it completely persuasive. It, it, it works persuasive and even to the extent that you develop the argument it's a self-destruct. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, thing. But when you raise the criticism or are an alternative, they seem so painful. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it seems on the level of I mean, we can we can stand outside and you know imagine <coughs> other forms of a new uh, economics of desire, which is new, but it but it seems incommensurate with what's going on, you know, less than a mile away from you. Know, so that it, it, one can't see where it really connects, except sort of seeing in and holding a theory, of course, we don't have to believe in historical necessity, it can be the change, but it just seems like a feeble gesture compared to the powerful analysis of what you've given, of what's, what's happening. I mean, it, it's, my own view is, I think there's little fear that really isn't in an intelligent reading of Marx. I mean, he deeply understood the replacement quality of what would happen. And it happened, I mean, of course, where, 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 in my view, where Marx doesn't understand is what he thought, thought there was a resistance, he thought there was a necessary a dialectical kind of reaction, and that's what we begin to do with confidence. And so I just want to really speak to that issue. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I, uh, I completely... Uh, not that I think anybody can. <laughs> no, 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 but I, I, I plead guilty in the sense that I, I, I completely agree with you, so I feel there is a, a remarkable insufficiency, if not deficiency, on the more, on the response and the more constructive side. So, yeah. uh, if I were very hopeful, I would say, well, it's only the beginning, so you know, give me another 10 years and you'll have it. <laughs> Yeah. Sort of perfect solution, well, kind of but of course I don't believe. Them. Of course I don't believe. That. <laughs> I don't believe that. So then the question is also uh, how much can one expect from philosophy? Right. And I think that is that is the ultimate uh, that is the ultimate question. How far does philosophy go? And now I have in mind oh, because I have been working with Foucault for this question, but in one of the lecture courses, uh, one asks someone asks him. What are we to do? And and he says, of course, he's very uncomfortable with that question. He says, as a philosopher, we cannot ever tell anyone what to do. The only thing I can give you are certain tools that can be used as leverage, ways that you can see things, 
So it's that sort of critical genealogical uh, aspect of philosophy that he wants to retain. Uh, he says, so I, have, I don't have any advice to anyone. He says, the only thing that I can advise you not to do is, he says, don't, don't do politics. Ne faites pas de politique. And then in that lecture course, I think it's the, it's the, it's the, 70, it's the 77 lecture course, or the one before that, I don't know. Um, it's translated as, don't engage in polemics. He says, don't, don't do politics. But I think the politics that he has in mind then is this sort of uh, um, elected politics. You know, don't don't become an elected representative. Don't don't be part of that game uh, because then you're already in structures of power. So I do think that uh, philosophy, at a more modest, at its most modest, can be can can be effective at a micro 